what a privilege to come into God's presence, just to linger with the one who set me free. As I lift my eyes and see his awesome glory, I remember who he is and bow the knee. Bow the knee.
Good morning, moms and dads, boys and girls. Welcome back to Westgate Baptist Church's Children's Service. My name is Mr. Macon. Let's get started in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this fine Sunday. You've given us a chance to hear from your word, to learn, to sing songs, Lord, and to glorify you. I pray that we would do all that this morning. And Lord, this week, as we live this week, may we do it for you and for your honor and glory. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Boys and girls, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Well, boys and girls, did you notice that in that verse, the Bible mentions two things to set aside? One is a weight. It's not necessarily sin, but it could distract us from serving the Lord. And the other, yes, was sin, both of which needs to be set aside if we're going to be a runner focused on running the race for the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, to illustrate that, I want this bag to represent you and I, boys and girls. And inside of this bag, as you can see, there are some items in it. Well, sometimes the Lord, through his word or through your parents, the teachers, may reveal things in your heart and life that ought not be there. Sometimes it is sin. The Lord may convict us and say, you know what? You've allowed this inside your life. Let's ask the Lord to forgive us of our sin and get that out. Or in other cases, it could be just something that you've allowed in your life. That's not a sin, but it could distract you from serving the Lord. Maybe the Lord is prompting you to set that aside so it's no longer weighing you down from serving the Lord. Now, as you can see, we have these things out. This bag appears empty. Well, what can the Lord do with something that appears to be empty like this? Well, the Lord can do a lot if we let him. If we let the Lord inside of our hearts to do exactly what he wants after he has purged some of these things out of our lives, he can take something beautiful out of our hearts and lives like this for his honor and for his glory. And this process repeats. There is so much the Lord can do with someone who has just simply surrendered to him who have gotten these weights and sins out of the way so they are clear and ready to run the race for the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, boys and girls, what things, weights, or sins may the Lord be placing his finger on in your life that needs to be set aside? There's some things to think on. Well, stay tuned. We're going to sing some songs together. Good morning. We're going to begin singing, Oh, Naaman Went Down to the River to Dip. Now we know based on the Bible story that Naaman only dipped in the river seven times, but there might be a few more dips thrown into this song. So every time you hear the word dip, make sure you actually dip. Here we go. Oh, Naaman went down to the river to dip. Oh, Naaman went down to the river to dip. Oh, Naaman went down to the river to dip. And he dipped, and he dipped, and he dipped, and he dipped. Danny dip, Danny dip, Danny dip. Oh, Naaman went down to the river to dip. So last week we talked about how God appeared to Moses from that burning bush. And remember Moses, he was a little afraid to be the leader of Israel and lead them out of Egypt back to the promised land. But God gave him a couple of signs to show those Israelites that Moses was the chosen leader that God wanted uh, to be the leader. And so we see that Moses, after he was done talking with God, uh, he went and met his brother Aaron. And Aaron was a a really, really good speaker. And uh, he was a lot better than Moses was. And so Aaron would be the one who would... uh, speak in front of people, in front of the Israelites, in front of Pharaoh as well. And so God commanded Moses and Aaron to go to Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, I'm going to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and back to the promised land. But when they went up to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's like, no, you're not going to leave. And he actually made all of the Israelites work even harder Before then, the Israelites already had a a tough job, uh, just trying to build all of these things and all of these uh, buildings and possibly pyramids as well. But Pharaoh made the Israelites work even harder. Before this time, the the Egyptians would be able to gather the material that the Israelites needed in order to build these buildings. But now, after that, Pharaoh made all of the Israelites even gather their materials that they needed to build. So there was a lot more work that they had to do. 
And so God saw that though. God saw the difficulties and the hardships that the Israelites were going through. And so he sent 10 plagues onto Egypt. And uh, I'm not going to list all of the plagues, but some of the plagues were hail. There were lice. There were locusts. There, it was turning the water into blood. There are all sorts of different plagues out there that God put onto Egypt. But do you know what that 10th plague was? That 10th plague was probably the worst out of them all. The 10th plague was the death of the firstborn child. And so if the people did not have the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, then the angel of the Lord would pass over their house and then the uh, the firstborn child of that family would die. But if the family did have uh, the blood of the lamb over their doorposts, then the angel of the Lord would pass over and the firstborn child would not die. And so that 10th plague was very devastating to those who didn't have the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. And so finally it was time. The angel of the Lord passed over Egypt and all of the houses, the houses uh, in Egypt and those that did not have the blood of the lamb on their do- doorposts Uh, Their firstborn child had died. But those that did have the blood of the lamb had uh, their firstborn safe from death. And uh, so after that, though, Pharaoh finally let the Israelites go and leave Egypt. So come back next week to find out what the Israelites did next. Proverbs 1.10 says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. We're going to learn a song today based on that Bible verse. If sinners entice thee, don't give in. Say no, say no. If sinners entice thee, don't give in. Say no, no, no. Say no to your friends who want you to sin. Say no to the devil who wants to win. If sinners entice thee, don't give in. Say no, no, no. Hey, I got my circular saw. Found this one. Hoo hoo, this is a beauty. What power this one has in it. Yeah, I do use my power tools in a tie. Yeah, it's my tools, my tie. Anyways, but hey, we're on a... uh, You want me to start this up? Fire this up here? Well, we're in church right now. Oh, better not make the noise. I tell you what, this is going to take... This right here is going to maybe make the lights dim or something because this one has a lot of power. You want to hear this? You want to hear it? Oh, I just too many people want to hear this. Okay, let's start this thing up. Okay, ready? Okay, got my finger on the trigger here. Oh, power tools are supposed to be really powerful. It's not even going or starting up at all. Uh, You know, power tools work better probably when they're plugged into a source. You know, this thing won't fire up and be the power tool it needs to be without a source of power. Well, they just kind of look good, don't they? And we don't want to use power tools and just look good. We want to be able to use them. It needs to be plugged into a source. Well, as we turn to Colossians chapter 1 here today, Colossians chapter number 1, and as we think about what messages we've been going through. Last week, the power of the resurrection. Colossians chapter 1 mentions the first power we went through, the power of the cross, Colossians 1 verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. And that's why I say there's three powers we're going to talk about in three weeks in the scriptures. The Bible says in verse 20 of Colossians chapter 1, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him, we first of all see the power of the cross and what powerful thing that was. And then we see the power of emptiness. You say, there's no power in emptiness. When my stomach's empty, it's not powerful at all. And yeah, I know it isn't. But there's a power of an empty tomb, which means the power of the resurrection. 
And then today's message, I want to bring out another power. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. That's how the song goes. The power of a living Savior. The power of a living Savior. You don't have to turn there, but in Matthew chapter number 28, after Jesus had resurrected and he was giving a commission and a command to the disciples and the followers, he said this, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's Matthew 28, 18. All power is given unto me. And then he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Do you know what? Some of this power is for us too. Hey, say, why do you say it so quietly? Well, I'll say it a little bit more loudly, but I want you to hear this. Some of this power is for us today too. You say, the power? Do, do I need to have the power to die on the cross? No. What about the power to resurrect myself from my own grave? No, not that power. But we get some of this power too. All power is given unto him, or power, Jesus said, all power is given unto me so that he could work through us and in us and so that we can have the power to live the Christian life. The power of a living Savior. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Uh, and because he lives, there's a few things that I'm thinking about today and I'm focusing on. Now, if he wasn't living, if he wasn't risen, if he was still in the grave, I don't know if we'd have this resurrection power today. I don't know if we'd have the power to live. Now, I want to take you to another verse here today that really illustrates the power that we can have to live the Christian life. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, you may not have time to turn over there, but we'll read the verse. If you do have time to turn over there, it's a tremendous, tremendous verse of Scripture in Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. The Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ. Uh, nevertheless, I live. Does the Bible say that I'm crucified with Christ so it's really hard? No, the Bible says this word, nevertheless, in spite of the fact. Wow. In spite of the fact that I have hard times, that I have circumstances, I have a, a, a Christian life to live, a race to run, nevertheless, I live. I am crucified with Christ, not, mm, I can't, so I can't have joy. I am crucified with Christ, so huh, I have things hard. There are times and some things in our life that are very difficult, maybe even right now. But Christ says, when we allow the power of him to work in us, he can work through us mightily. The Bible says, if we go back to Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 29, according to the power which worketh in me mightily, Paul says, which worketh in me mightily. We want God to do a mighty work through us, but we've got to let him use us. We've got to allow him to work through us. As we say, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. In spite of the fact, uh, besides all that, I live. And I live joyfully. And I live victoriously. And I live for Jesus Christ. Allow him to work through you today. Now, as we think about this, how does he do that? He really does it supernaturally. Uh, it, it doesn't, it's not like we're Superman or we're a superhero. We're just average people that a sinner saved by grace, he works through us if we allow him to. The hardened heart is not allowing God to work through them. The, the one who's, who's, who's sinning, uh, the sinful heart is not allowing Christ to work and flow through them, uh, flowing through us. God can't use us every day and every hour. When I was growing up as a boy, you know, I thought about all the people in my life or all the friends we hung out with. We were in a small country town in Idaho. And in this small country town, I was thinking about all the handful of people I used to play with. There's Tom and there's Mike and there's, there's uh, Joe and there's uh, Jeff and there's a bunch of guys we used to be out there playing with. And you know, I thought about one situation and one story where the power of Christ was working. We were just a bunch of average kids and there was a couple teenagers that were a little bit older than me and they were, uh, I looked up to them and I was out there one day and 
One day we were in church, you know, and I saw there's some of my friends across the church and, and uh, we were in church and there was a young man that came to church. In fact, he was a little bit older than me. I was about eight years old and he was about thir- uh, 14 or 15 years old. He was a teenager. You know, I came to church with my parents that day. He came to church alone. He came all by himself. He would come to church uh, a couple of times or a few times without his parents. I remember hanging around his younger brother. I remember hang- going to his house. I lived in this house that was underground. And I went home one day and said, Mom, Dad, uh, underground houses are really cool. It's great. It's like under the ground and you just kind of... Anyway, sometimes their house was a mess and sometimes there's a pile of clothes everywhere. We used to run around there and then go outside and just have a great time with his family. But I didn't know his older brother. I didn't know this, this boy that came to church as well as I knew his younger brother. But I remember one time in church, I'll never forget what happened. In fact, it kind of scared us. As he was sitting in church and the pastor was preaching the sermon. And in the middle of the sermon, in came through the back door. The door swung open and there was a man that stomped. He had a stomp to him as he came halfway into the church. And what he did next is I'll never forget. I've never seen it happen before. I don't think I'll ever see it happen again. Is he took the boy by the shrug of the soldiers there. He grabbed him by his shirt and his collar and he started pulling him up. And this young man said, uh, what are you doing, Dad? I, I want to be in church. I don't want to go. I don't want to. And the man says, son, you're coming with me. And he started to pull him out of the pew, pull him out of the seat and get him out of the church. And boy, people were looking around. They didn't know what to think. And we were kind of a little bit scared. And was this boy going to stay in church because he really wanted to come to church? Or was he going to follow his father out of the church? We were thinking that was a scary situation for us. The pastor stopped his message halfway through and he said to the young man, he said, go with your dad. You need to go with your dad. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, when we that boy marches out of church and his dad just uh, meanly and angrily marched him out of the church building. And I didn't see that boy for another few weeks. You know, I didn't think I'd see that boy again. And I thought that it was dad was mean at that time. We went home. We started praying for that boy and that family. We didn't, uh, and so he followed his dad. He did what his parents wanted him to do. And a few weeks later, our eyes began to open real wide in church one day because we saw him walking into the church. We saw him coming into the church. He wasn't with his dad. I don't know what happened to his dad. I don't know if his dad was on a trip, but that boy got to keep coming to church over and over again. You know, I lost track of that boy. And years later, it's years. If you'll go a few states over into the Eastern United States, you'll see a man and his wife and his grown children serving in a church, serving God, doing ministries, joyful, posting scripture and challenging people spiritually on media, been part of the same church for about 35 years. Think they're moving to another state, just bought a home and is gonna be part of another ministry here in a transition in their life. But you know, I never knew what would happen. But that is just nevertheless I live. Now that boy have been through a lot. And you might be going through a lot today. But nevertheless he lived. He let Christ work through him. And he's serving Christ fully and blessedly right now here in his life. How could God do a situation with that? Is because we have a living Savior. And because he's allowing us to nevertheless I live. And we're allowing Christ. Christ is really working through that man Um, and through his life there. So let me challenge you with this today. This is the power of a living Savior. We're going to end this morning by singing the fear of the Lord. Please stand. The fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, beginning of wisdom, the fear of the the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding, understanding, understanding. God will bless them all, both the great and small, all who fear the Lord. Excellent singing this morning. Isn't it amazing? when we see the power of a living Savior working in our lives. 
Hey, join us in a few minutes for our next service, and we'll see you here next week for our kids' service.